Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to the Tapestry of Sacred Music, and this is the Sufi, uh, Sufi, Sufi culture talk, introduction to Sufi culture. So my name is Xiang Hui, and I am the one of the festival programmers. Uh, yeah. So this festival celebrates in three days the sharing of sacred cultures and music from around the world. And uh, today we are very proud to have with us Mr. Imran Ahmed uh, to give us a talk on the introduction to Sufism and what it means to be a Sufi today. So, uh, just a few credentials. Uh, Mr. Imran, uh, his interest in Islam began during his college days when he studied philosophy of religion. Subsequently, he has done extensive reading on recent Islamic empires. In Singapore, he has a keen interest in Muslim affairs and is involved with the Association of Muslim Professionals, Muslim Expa Expatriates Association. So, without further ado, let me pass the time to Mr. Imran. Thank you, Ziyanghi, uh, and thank you, of course, uh, to the Esplanade uh, for allowing me this opportunity, and thank you all for coming. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm going to try and make sure the mic doesn't move around so you can continue to hear me, but if uh, you can't, I don't know, raise your hand or say something, uh, and uh, I will make sure that I uh, notice. So, today, uh, I'm going to give you an introduction into uh, some of the practices and some of the traditions of uh, Sufi Islam and let me start with something uh, a little bit unusual. Uh, I've started with a quote from the new Pope and that's because Sufi Islam is not something that one can explain very easily but I'm going to try in the next 45 minutes to an hour uh, but the reason I chose this quotation is because Sufism is very much something to do with the heart. It's not about the intellect, it's about the heart and the spirit. And if anyone has the opportunity or has already familiarized themselves with Sufi literature, whether it's poetry, whether it's verse, uh, uh, anything of that nature, you will keep finding uh, allusions to the heart and the symbolism that the heart represents. So understand that like Islam or like religion, Sufism is something that uh, is a very personal journey and I'm just going to be able to scratch the tip of the iceberg uh, for you. Hopefully it will set off some, uh, uh, some wheels in motion for you to try and understand this uh, a little bit more. Well. Who are uh, Sufis or people that we uh, call Sufis? I mean, there's a romantic notion that uh, these are a bunch of people that wear robes, lead ascetic lives, uh, run around uh, the world or the countryside uh, preaching and praising uh, God. And uh, then when they die, their graves become centers of attraction for people who have heard of them, heard of some of the uh, special things that these people have done. That's true, but uh, actually Sufism is a lot more than simply uh, uh, what uh, I have just talk talked about. Sufis as defined, uh, Sufism as defined by Sufis, I've got a few quotations here again. Uh, we can see that Sufism is a very serious part of Islam. Sufis take the religion very seriously and what they are trying to achieve is something that in many ways has a universal uh, uh, concept or connotations and we can see from some of the uh, from the ideas uh, that whether it's talking about a union with God or we are uh, that people should be without uh, attachments, that some of these concepts almost appear polytheistic in, uh, in nature, in the sense that if you were to read some of these quotations and I were to change the names to perhaps a Buddhist or a Hindu, they wouldn't necessarily be out of place. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, it, Sufis are in any way less religious or uh, do not believe in the unity of God as Islam uh, decrees, 
but it speaks to this universal spiritual desire and spiritual attainment which Sufis uh, try and reach. So, in a sense, what the Sufis are really trying to do is they are trying to find this inner truth and their lives are a journey towards finding that inner truth uh, or uh, hakika. Now, to Sufis, God is the truth, God is goodness, God is virtue. So anything positive that we can talk about in the world can in some sense be encapsulated in God and in the unity of God. To some extent, this is actually also uh, the reason why in Islam we have these various 99 names of God. They're characteristics of God. And so for Sufis, to be able to find the inner truth means actually to connect with God. And that's what their entire life <coughs> and their entire purpose uh, has uh, become. Clearly, it's not easy for ordinary mortals to just try and connect with God in a way that, uh, uh, that lifts us beyond the normal perceptions of space and time. Uh, but the Sufis uh, have ways in which uh, they try and achieve this. So before we go into what exactly differentiates the Sufis from ordinary Muslims because we have to understand that Sufis are at their core and at their heart Muslims. So for a Sufi it is very important that they adhere to both the external and the internal aspects of the religion. And these external aspects are what ordinary Muslims uh, are expected to also adhere to. We're talking about the five uh, pillars of Islam and of course all the other practices of what I will loosely term the Sharia uh, for them. So whether it's praying five times a day, giving uh, zakat or alms uh, from, their, uh, from their wealth, uh, going for hajj uh, and um, the other uh, aspects, these are things that a Sufi has to do in order to try and achieve uh, and get to the next level which Sufis wish to do. If we find that an individual Sufi is not adhering to these five tenets, uh, it means that this individual will face issues in trying to move further up the spiritual journey, if, if I can express it uh, that way. So the five pillars, the basics of Islam have to be rooted and are inherent in any individual that wants to be a Sufi uh, and practice Sufi Islam. We of course, and I did it here as well, uh, add mysticism into it. The Sufis don't necessarily see it that way. They don't necessarily often perceive of themselves to be mystics, but it's a convenient label uh, that, we, uh, that we do attribute uh, to them. Because to them, it's a very straightforward journey uh, to try and achieve this union uh, to God. This is again uh, a quotation. I'm using quotations to illustrate uh, that while there is a lot of diversity within Sufism, there are many different orders, many different structures, many beliefs. Uh, at the core, just like in Islam where you have a tremendous, tremendous amount of diversity, at its core you will find certain principles and tenets which everyone does have to adhere to and which are commonly accepted across uh, these schools whether these schools be a part of Sunni or Shia Islam. Uh, Sufis and Sufi mysticism uh, orders 
are found across the entire spectrum uh, of Islam. So clearly, if you don't practice the five uh, pillars or ordinary uh, Sharia, which uh, everyone uh, else is expected to do, uh, it's not possible for you to become a Sufi in the real sense of the word. But Sufism complements these five pillars and the behaviors which ordinary people or ordinary Muslims are expected to adhere to. Uh, of course, the objective is the same for them as it is for us, uh, hopefully, which is to be, a, to be a good individual. They choose a certain path, but I'd like to explain a little bit about that path because this is where they differ and take a slightly different route from, uh, from ordinary Muslims. I cannot just stand up and say I'm a Sufi because that's just not the way it goes. In order for someone to be able to claim or state that they are Sufi in the real sense, uh, they have to join a religious order or something called tariqa. Some of you may know the word uh, in, in Urdu meaning uh, uh, the way or the path. I think it also means the same thing in Arabic. In Turkish they uh, call these uh, tariqas something slightly different but essentially we're talking about a religious order. Uh, those of uh, us who may not be completely familiar with, uh, with the way uh, or what I mean by an order, uh, perhaps you are familiar with some of the uh, Christian orders, the Benedictine, the Franciscan and Dominican orders. Uh, often academics have compared Sufi orders with these three particular orders. And in a Sufi order, when you join, you are initiated into the order. So there's an actual initiation ceremony which varies from school to school. Academics again have suggested that uh, this is somewhat akin to the baptism ceremony that takes place for all Catholics. Muslims, of course, we don't have a baptism ceremony, so we cannot claim to be automatically initiated into any particular school or order. Uh, Catholics, uh, in that sense, actually have an advantage. Uh, they can uh, uh, move forward because that uh, initiation rite has taken place. Now, the initiation rite varies across schools. Uh, it can be as simple as, as professing your faith in God and uh, the unity of God and uh, the finality of the prophethood, or it can involve uh, much more extensive rituals, uh, including chanting and memorizing of prayers, uh, etc., etc. It just varies. Uh, once you are initiated, then uh, you have what is called a a mentor essentially, uh, a, uh, a murshid or a shaykh, someone who is to guide you in this path of uh, the Sufi. This is very important because the path of a Sufi is not something that is open or uh, easy for everyone to follow. It can, in fact, Sufis themselves suggest that trying to do certain Sufi rituals or certain Sufi beliefs without the supervision of a sheikh or a murshid or a master can be very dangerous because it's, uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, saying that you know when you know something halfway and you try and do something uh, uh, that it could lead to accidents. It could so you don't really know how to drive but you think you know how to drive so let me go out on the road and drive you might have an accident. So it's similar to that because uh, uh, as I will explain a little bit further, the rituals are a way in which this union with God can, uh, is, is encouraged and tried to be achieved. So it's not something that, uh, that you want anyone who is not ready for it to be able to do because uh, some experiences may actually even prove to be traumatic uh, for uh, individuals. So this 
notion of having a master or a sheikh is very, very important. The, I, I alluded to this, uh, these rituals and this attempt to have transcendental religious experiences. This is at the heart of many Sufi practices, if not all. So the, think of the, the, the romantic notion or the ideas that we have of the whirling dervish or these uh, other individuals who are uh, playing drums and singing and chanting or even just uh, entranced while they are rocking around in prayer. This is part of this ritual to try and encourage a transcendental religious experience. This is not something that is done for the sake of showing religiosity or uh, for any uh, other purpose but simply to try and get closer to God because as I mentioned the objective is to, to try and achieve virtue and that virtue lies in God and if we can experience God then that will help us to understand certain things which we may not be able to understand now. So to come back to the idea that I uh, mentioned earlier of this, these universal concepts where uh, it was perhaps uh, uh, I mentioned that these religious experiences or trying to achieve oneness, trying to extinguish the world. Here we have another notion of perhaps uh, some of us may wish to call it a meditation or a way in which um, humans try and achieve a certain state of mind. So while I'm not saying or suggesting that it's the same as what a, a Hindu or a Buddhist uh, will do when they are chanting or when they are trying to achieve nirvana, there are parallels that we can draw with the type of activities that uh, these Sufi religious orders uh, do indulge in. Now, religious experience, as I mentioned, is is at the heart of what the Sufi is trying to uh, achieve. Mainly because, um, if we go back to uh, a study of, say, philosophy of religion, it's actually considered to be a proof of the existence of God. So if an individual has a religious experience which is transcendental, then there's no way that he or she can not believe in the existence of God because they have experienced it themselves. And what exactly do we mean when we talk about a religious experience? Well, again, excuse me, this is something of the heart, something that is difficult for us to explain, but luckily there are uh, psychologists who have tried to uh, decipher and understand these things. So let me give you uh, some idea of what uh, a religious experience means as far as academia is concerned. So I'm going to talk about it uh, or give you these, uh, these four ideas which don't necessarily uh, suggest that this is the way a Christian or a Muslim, because let's not forget that there are Christian mystics and the religious experiences that they describe tend to be fairly consistent with the type of religious experiences described uh, by their Muslim counterparts. So this is more of an academic psychological uh, uh, explanation that I'm going to, uh, uh, to share with you. And this was, uh, came, uh, this was devised by a psychologist uh, in the early part of the last century. So, in fact, it's a series of lectures that he delivered in 1902. Uh, a gentleman called William James, who happens to be the brother of the writer uh, Henry James. Um, he talked about a religious experience having four main characteristics. I have uh, uh, listed them there. It must be transient, ineffable, noetic, and passive. Let me explain uh, them a little bit more. Transient, it's te temporary. It's a temporary state of mind. We cannot be in a religious experience or in this mystical state for extended periods of time. It is not something that we can achieve today and stay in 
until we die or for the rest of our life. Uh, it is transient, it comes and it goes. Um, it's ineffable, which means that it's difficult for an individual who has had that experience to be able to adequately describe it to others. Of course, um, we try. Uh, I, I shouldn't say we, but individuals try. And here is where a lot of the literature and the verses, uh, of course, Rumi being the most popular, uh, uh, especially among the uh, non-Muslim community. But there are literally uh, scores of uh, Sufi writers, theologians, who have tried. There's a gentleman, uh, a theologian called Al-Ghazali, very, very critical and influential in making Sufism accepted among mainstream Islam. He has written lots of books, uh, theological studies, trying to explain some of these things. In fact, he's even got a chapter in one of his books uh, which explains the experience and what we can expect to find if any individual actually makes it to heaven and what we see. So, of course people try, but it's ineffable because it's, an, it's a very, very personal and unique experiences and it varies from day to day, from time to time, from person to person. So, um, we can't necessarily understand what it is until we are able uh, to have it ourselves. It's noetic. Uh, which is uh, uh, kind of a uh, fancy word for saying that it gives us some knowledge. Again, I refer to the fact that a religious experience in some quarters is believed to be sufficient to demonstrate the existence of God. It's a proof that God exists. But there's more to it than that because as humans, we live in a particular dimension and a particular state. Uh, so we understand time and we understand space in a certain way. We knew that uh, this talk was to be scheduled for 4.30, so 4.25 maybe it would be a good time to show up and we know and expect that it will end at 5.30 and it was on a Sunday and we knew the location to be the Esplanade. Now, a uh, noetic experience is often, as far as described by some of these mystics, beyond the framework and perceptions of our normal framework of space and time. So, what we understand as space and time, in a sense, doesn't exist in that, during that particular period of, a, uh, of that experience, which is why they, these individuals are often suggests that they get knowledge which is not open or available to uh, to everyone else. Uh, it's passive. Uh, passive means that while we may be able to do things that encourage a religious experience, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will have one. So just like we can I, get, I, I imagine as a Buddhist we can practice uh, uh, um, meditation our entire life. We don't necessarily have to, uh, uh, that individual may not necessarily achieve nirvana. It's the same thing here, that we can do things that enable and encourage us and put us in a framework where religious experience becomes more likely, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen. And if it does, it's beyond our control insofar as when it happens, how long it happens, and how long it stays with us. So it's passive. Um, it doesn't often stay with us. I talked about some of the characteristics or some of the behaviors which Sufis um, indulge in in order to try and create an enabling environment for these religious experiences and in fact some of us may even uh, be subconsciously aware of them so having seen 
a show with the whirling dervishes. I know the uh, Esplanade and it's this Tapestry of Fates festival uh, has even in this uh, in this session has had uh, several Sufi musicians uh, appear and perform. Those are actually part of the behaviors and rituals which Sufi orders encourage and formalize in order to assist their members to have these religious experiences. So, very quickly, uh, religious experiences, uh, dhikr or zikr, uh, as is somewhat said, it's a prayer. We have to understand that for Muslims in general and for Sufis in particular, the remembrance of God is very, very important because even the, uh, the word God or the phrases uh, that are used to uh, symbolize and uh, use as prayers, just by uttering those phrases and repeating them, it is believed that you are getting closer to God. It's because by remembering God, you're getting closer to God. And again, the objective is to have that communion with God because God is virtue, good, etc. So the zikr is a, essentially an uh, uh, invocatory prayer. And it's a uh, ritual. So it's more than just the prayer. So when we talk about the whirling dervishes, or perhaps if you saw some of these uh, Sufi musicians, uh, you will remember that uh, they are chanting certain things. There's a certain prayer that they are doing, but they're also undertaking certain rituals. Uh, in the case of the whirling dervishes, of course, the spinning. Uh, in others, uh, uh, it's sim singing. Uh, there's even dancing in some. But there's always some sort of a ritual. And within that ritual is a prayer. And the prayer is the wird. This is the phrase, the word, the set of phrases, the set of prayers that is repeated during this recitation. And this is the remembrance of God. So this is how these Sufis are trying to create an environment and a state of mind in which they are opening themselves up to God by remembering God. And they are trying to actually extinguish everything else from their mind. So again, without suggesting that, that they're the same, one can draw some parallels with perhaps uh, Buddhism or Hinduism in some uh, parts by talking about Nirvana and even other religions where you are one is trying to fill oneself up with God and uh, eject everything else for that particular uh, point in time. The both the zikr and the wird vary from school to school or from order to order. So that is why some Sufi orders will not, uh, uh, will not have a music, others will have dancing, uh, 